last Sunday morning, me mate Boomerang. Said he was having a few people round for a barbie. Said he might cook a burrow or two. I said, sounds great, will Wallaby there? He said, yeah, and Veggie might come too. In 1983, comedian Ostentatious made the country's biggest selling single ever. She said, I'll go dingoes. Everything in the 80s in Australia had to be big. You got two blonde women standing on a dockside. They both got big fish. One goes bang and hits the other one in the head. The other one goes pew, picks up a fish and goes bang and hits her, right? So that's what you do. You know, that's it. That's, it. that's the whole video. The 80s were really, was the decade of greed and um, it was, everybody seemed to have a lot of money, it was before the stock market crashed and um, everything was very opulent. Um, all of a sudden music became perfection, you know, there was no room for human error, um, everything had to be note perfect and it was perfection which I think in hindsight is a pretty silly way to go with music. <laughs> For the followers of a small new movement called punk, the challenge was to be heard at all over the din of excessive self-promotion. I remember feeling really pissed off with Australia because not only, not just the industry itself, but the audience as well needed America or England to tell them what was good music when we'd been basically playing the same kind of stuff. This generation of musicians would ask themselves the question, excess or exile? Today, I thought I might be able to see America from up here. You're just across the Pacific, you know. Hello. Looks like a boatload of your countrymen coming in there now. This was the decade when Australians realised they had something to be proud of. Better fill the icebox and fire up the barbie. Just like the Tourist Commission, the local music industry was proud of Australia and ready for the biggest challenge of all, selling Australia's bands to the Americans. It was a group of survivors from the 60s who devised the initial marketing strategy. Give the Americans something they could relate to. More American music. We were paving a four-lane highway across the country for other Australian acts to follow. Well, why not name it uh, after an Australian river? Yeah, well, we had the idea of calling it Murrumbidgee. Yes. But, you know, that's a bit too obvious. I think. The American audiences are great, you know, they love it. It's their stuff, you know, rock and roll or contemporary music or pop music, they invented it. We copied it, you know, we adapted it. And to go there and sell it to them and have it appreciated by them was a great joy, it was fantastic. Little River Band's world was mellow, a West Coast comfort zone, stuck somewhere in the recent past. It happened to be the right music at the right time for America. I mean, we had a lot of success there. We sold millions of records, and uh, I, the, the latter stages there, I mean, first under the wire, sleeper catcher, we shipped on release day platinum, which meant we shipped one million albums on the first day of release. Try and do that today. Hurry, don't be late. LRB's nostalgic sounds held America captive, 
Queensland's hillbilly premier, Joe Bjocchi Peterson, used less subtle methods to keep the Sunshine State firmly in the past. Hello, you kids. I heard you swearing. I'm putting you up. Go-Between's drummer, Lindy Morrison, was part of an inner-city Brisbane scene where music was about resistance. Queensland was a horrible um, place to live in. It was incredibly conservative, and if you're going to live there and be part of a, an artistic subculture, you were inevitably going to be radical. Punk was all about alienation, being out of the mainstream. Generally, there was just a fundamentalist Christian um, attitude from the police and from everyone around us and, uh, and trying to oppress anybody. And I think that's why Queensland was the most exciting um, place to be in the 70s and into the late 70s. And I think it's why um, uh, punk music took such a hold there. Even before the Sex Pistols went into the studio in London, Brisbane's own punk band The Saints were practising in a garage. Hi, I'm Chris from The Saints, and this rather salubrious photographic studio used to be the world-famous Club 76. Let's have a look at it. Hmm. This rather shishi little entrance hall used to be a bucket where we used to vomit a lot. And in there was a bedroom where Ivy used to sleep. I think it's when it was shagging Ed's girlfriend. And as Geoffrey called it, it was the famous night of the banging symbols, because there was a big symbol up on the wall. Oh, the halcyon days of youth. The Saints didn't try to break into the corporate music culture of the late 70s. They bypassed it. They paid to have their own single recorded and pressed, and they were signed directly to EMI in the UK, where punk was about to explode. I just think we thought we were big grown-ups and other people could do it, so why couldn't we? Uh, if I remember correctly, Ed was actually working in a warehouse, and if he hadn't have been working there and if someone hadn't have told him that you could do a custom pressing, it might have been different. I'm Stranded was about being marooned in deep suburban space. I just thought it was odd to see, like, punky rockers in this sunshine. It just it didn't make any sense to me at all. Because um, I guess it's very difficult to keep your mohawk up when it's now uh, 100 degrees. Pockets of punk-minded devotees around the country were taking note. We had a whole lot of diverse kind of information coming in, but the Saints went on stage and they were... They had the kind of fuck you attitude down like no, no other band I've ever seen. Chris Bailey would, would sometimes not even come on stage. He'd sort of sing from off in the wings in a heap somewhere. And um, this kind of stuff was just extraordinary for us to be seeing this. I've been contemplating suicide, but it really doesn't suit my style. Nick Cave was to become a very different kind of Australian icon one who seemed to hate everything about mainstream Australia. His band, The Boys Next Door, later renamed The Birthday Party, were a bunch of arty grammar school kids from Melbourne who took to the spirit of punk, if not the politics. Not even my felt 
that they were ever going to get anywhere. So you could make the kind of music that you wanted to make, or you, you could push, push the boundaries of the whole thing wherever you wanted it to go. Some characters work both ends of the spectrum. At Richmond Recorders in Melbourne, sound engineer Tony Cohen recorded commercial acts by day and underground acts like Nick Cave by night. Oh, I can't remember the years. I'm all very foggy about that. I don't know why. It's just funny things happen in memory. I quite enjoyed it. I thought, you know, all the drugs and the mucking around, the rat bagness of it all. Is that a word? Rat bagginess? Uh, it was fantastic. But this, this was, like I said, the first introduction. And the next thing, I'm going down to the ballroom uh, to check them out and things like that. In the end, I ended up going and seeing their gigs from outside because it was so damn painful. I have to stand outside to be able to enjoy it. The whole thing was just fueled with kind of amphetamine and alcohol, and you know, you sort of stir it all up and. Um, you've got a kind of chronic state of psychosis going on. I think that was what was happening within the band. The punk movement called for the total deconstruction of rock music. It was all about individuality. No experience required. With two men like Rob, I mean particularly Robert, he was so feminine. We had so uh, such a hard time in all the pubs, really. You know, we got... On, at Narrabeen, we got, you know, thrown off the stage. The manager just came and said, you can't play, you know. Well, he didn't realise it was hip not to be able to play. <laughs> the Triffids got the same kind of treatment in the pubs of Perth. There was a, a, a definitely a period where we got glassed and where we got um, iced and um, where we got canned. As punk diversified, it split into many tribes. <laughs> the corporate culture of cock rock was challenged by do-it-yourself bands with tone-deaf singers, wimps playing synthesizers, and most shocking of all, girls on bass and drums. You get these men, you know, standing in the audience going, you know, sit on my face and Deb and I would go, why is your nose bigger than your dick, you know. And, we'd, we'd, and we did feel uh, that it was very unfortunate sometimes that the focus of the band were tits. You talk about We all had stupid hairdos, you know, we were all sniff enamel, we were all falling over on mandrax, we were all getting pissed until we, you know, couldn't remember what day it was. It, it was, it was a very much close-knit, um, we all knew each other very, very well, we all, everyone was in a band. There was a course at the, at the CAE in Flinders Street in electronic music and uh, I was, I'd been kicked out of school, I was 16 and, uh, and we played on these fantastic synthesizers, these Moogs and, and they were truly exotic instruments and uh, you couldn't keep them in tune, you couldn't play a chromatic piece with them and uh, they were totally unpredictable so the whole punk thing was a kind of a very convenient uh, use to kind of bring them into play because they were so unpredictable, you know, you were at a loss to do anything else with them. Punk was a cultural movement. It was growing and it was subsidised by a unique government grant. Nearly everyone was on the dole. We felt that that was justified because we were creating something together. They don't, they don't know what the government's doing, they can't get a job, you know, they're getting all money on the dole. Right. They know about the government, but it's not. It's yeah. the average kid on the street, which is what punk is appealing to. You know, from the day one, day one that you're born sort of thing, you're sort of brought up to all these things that you should do and things you shouldn't do. As soon as you get into school, if you're a boy, you're taught how to play football and everything, and the girls are taught how to sail and cook and things like that. 
Art school was another form of government aid, diverted to fund the new music scene. Mental as anything were a parody of pub rock with their own take on Australiana. I was watching these guys who were in this rock and roll band, Mental as anything. I was just out of high school, and, and yep. they were all at art school. It just seemed like they didn't actually do anything. There didn't was do anything. All they seemed to do was hang around drinking beer in each other's houses, and that's where the the band sort of got its impetus from. All that time that was spent sort of drinking beer and listening to records and thinking, oh, we can do that. We were doing sort of, you know, Rolling Stones through the hillbilly stuff and even Hawaiian stuff and anything that anybody liked or had on a record, we'd have a go at. So, uh, you know, eventually we'd, we're playing so many tunes that you, you almost learn the craft of songwriting just by just by playing other people's songs and you switch the chords around and do a new combination and there you go, you got a you got an original song. The art school crowd modified the punk pose and took it way beyond the garage. They reinvented pop and the three minute song was back. Catchy songs didn't always get played on commercial radio. As the punk generation began to master their instruments, many of their followers had to tune into new radio stations like Double J and Triple R to hear a new sort of Australian song. Anyone who knew the go-betweens or knew our music knew that we were essentially a feminine band. And uh, that wasn't just me, you know, that, that was the whole light of the boys. I recall a boy in bigger pants Like everyone Just waiting for a chance His father's watch He left it in the shower From time to time the waste Memory waste And the waste Memory waste Australia's corporate music sector had much the same attitude as commercial radio. This is the currency of promotion in the record business. The slick promoters, the big corporations, the executives who regard music simply as product. In this business, the sweetest sound of all is the melodic jingle of the cash registers. To them, punk, or anything tarnished by it, meant commercial death. That didn't stop Mushroom Records mogul Michael Gudinski trying to make money out of it. All of a sudden I heard about some Australian band in Brisbane I hadn't even heard of getting rave interest in England. And then a, friend, um, a guy that we'd done a bit of work with who ironically was the original manager of Mississippi which became the Little River Band, which is a long way from punk music, came back from England and he had all the latest punk records and he wanted to start a punk label. So. In those days, I mean, we never thought too hard about these things. It wasn't like we had to go and see the bank manager. He might, you know, shut us down if we even talked to him. Or we'd, we didn't go out and get the accounts in and do a plan about this is going to be a punk label. We just went, here it comes. Suicide's tragedy was trying to sell punk as if it was just another kind of novelty. We marketed, we had chocolate bullets, we had to the point where we were sick of them, we had boxed them in the office, we had little cap guns, and this whole punk suicide thing, and we signed about half a dozen acts, and the label was never successful, but out of that label came Nick Cave, James Freud, 
Sean Kelly, you know, great people that went on to have phenomenal success. So that was really a time where we were right amongst, you know, the punk movement. And some of the real hardcore punks thought, oh, this is corporate and this is all too contrived. Gudinski missed out on one of the biggest hits of all time, a real novelty number. A lot of it was tongue in cheek, a lot of it was, was satirical. Uh, and I think that that was because of how we were brought up too. If you're not, also if you're not really sure what you're doing, often things get shrouded in humour. You think, oh well, kind of not quite sure what to do. Let's have a bit of a laugh, because I know that, I, I like that, I like to have a laugh. Here are men at work. Down Under was a strange concoction. Australiana with a reggae beat and piercing flute, written and sung by a Scotsman and produced by an American. It was really quite a bizarre thing. This guy was most horrified. He came into this <laughs> little studio in Richmond and had a mixing desk about this big, and he said, oh, God damn, you know, I need triangular making and all this sort of stuff. Oh, he was, well, we had mixing desks hired in from everywhere and cables that were, you know, so thick. That oh, was just the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen. But, but he made it work. He was actually quite good in the end. The sound of it and everything was terrific. I think he got a percentage of that lucky guy. Don't think he had to work again. <laughs> Do you come from a land down prime example of, of cultural arrogance because the, the American record company rejected the album twice at A&R because they didn't think there was any hits. And the record started to get played and even then the record company weren't too into it. They're going, they you know, kind of didn't like the cover, they thought we were a kind of a punk band and you know, come on. New wave. <laughs> you know. I said to speak my language. What Men at Work tapped was that other new phenomenon of the 80s, the video clip market. <laughs> It had a personality to it, it had a sense of humour. We were no longer just a record, but there was an identifiable, you know, Colin um, in the kilt, the sort of silly stuff that we did, the kind of homemade aspect of it really appealed. Down Under might have been tongue-in-cheek Australiana, but it gave the salesmen their corporate soundtrack. And for the punks, it was a sign of much worse things to come. Those who couldn't take it anymore chose the road to exile. The Saints and later Nick Cave were the first of many who thought they'd find acceptance and success in London. Without making a plan or buying bus tickets, it just seemed, it just did seem inevitable that we would make it to, to London. Um, and I'm not so fond of the English, so I don't even, I didn't, wasn't excited about that so much. I, I think what was exciting was just getting out of here. It's a sad state of affairs because actually what was going on in Australia at that time was far more interesting than what was going on in, in London. There was far more original uh, groups taking far more risks than what was going on in London. Five, one. Well, believe it or not, we've found Chris from the Saints uh, over here in London looking suitably cold and certainly not stranded. Um, first of all, welcome to Countdown oh, again. Thank you, Ian. Thank I guess we encountered the, the last vestige of British xenophobia against her colonial cousins. Um, we had absolutely zero credibility. Most of the articles were referred to kangaroos, etc., etc. And I don't think, it, from a critical point of view, uh, we were just lampooned as being some kind of like jocular ockers from the bush. I don't think they'd have to know what they're talking about. It's not, do you, still do. Do, 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 what do you actually class yourself as? You just class yourself as a, as a, a, a rather energetic rock and roll band, don't you? If you have to put a classification to your music. Yeah, talent I think as well. Yeah. Classification. Is. Right. Hello, Hello viewers, viewers of Countdown. Countdown. We're we Chris Bailey, Bailey of the Saints. And, and here is our, our new single called Know Your, your Prada. <laughs>
message of know your product made sure the Saints would never make it really big. They were still stranded, somewhere between punk and the pub. Back home, the pub circuit was still dominant, but the influence of punk was finally beginning to show. It started in the inner city and worked its way into the suburbs. It was a really great period that, that bred a lot of creativity and possibility, and it was all new and fresh. Chrissy Amphlett took on the beer bars with a sexually aggressive fashion statement. You mightn't have to be a really slick singer, but you could develop your style. And you didn't do big guitar solos. They were, and you know, Mark and I'd sit there. We hated guitar solos, and we'd sit there with little melody lines in our songs. I didn't want to be this phony showbiz person. So I went the other way and was as horrible as I possibly could be. So actually, men were quite scared of me and I liked that. And, um, um, you know, I was quite aggressive. Midnight Oil were a band from Sydney's northern beach suburbs with a sober political agenda. They were as punk as a pub audience could handle. I mean, you just had to dress, you just had to wear more black, you know, and it was okay. They had a serious message delivered in person by a belligerent bald giant. We didn't hate the suburbs, you know, we didn't sort of decide that once you played in a beer barn, you lost all your credibility. We actually thought that was a very good place to play. And I think for people, if they didn't agree with it, they just simply found it too strange. They just couldn't really make the connection because rock and roll traditionally has been about cars and girls and uh, now we were, in a sense, trying to make it into being about something else as well. The same surfy crowd went crazy about In Excess. There was a bit of a myth about inner city kids, yeah. you know, it was like... Uh, you get in there. It was, yeah, you know, but I say, as I said, when I say myth, I actually mean that. I think, you know, it was sort of like dark and scary. <laughs> they had enough punk attitude to be different, and Michael Hutchins looked and acted like a ready-made rock star. But I nearly had to fire him once, though. Did you? Yeah. Remember, you, remember? you did? Oh. Yeah, I, had, I sat him down in front of the... The band truck and said, "Look, mate, if you don't start helping with the gear, <laughs> you're out of the band." Okay? Yeah, I had a conversation <laughs> like that with him, but you can't, you, you can't make him. <laughs> he couldn't make it. He was like, no. he, "Mike will be off talking to girls or well. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the lead singer, so, <laughs> carrying his microphone. You know, <laughs> do you need a hand with that, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to survive doing pubs, and also you go along, and you see cultures, or you know, Jimmy is yeah. a good mate of ours. But you know, he'd stand there, and I remember thinking, you know, oh my God, when you see the audience's reaction to say Kay San, you think we can never do that. It's like you know, they have this thing. So we thought, hmm, what can we do that you know? So we we, we we thought, well, we we can't you know we can't get them all banging their heads all the time, but we can get them shaking their asses. Mm -hmm. you know? And that was where we kind of came in a bit. And, in a different area, mm. I think. The air shakers. Corporate Australia was in the shadows watching. Michael Godinsky's suicide label failed to make a buck out of punk, but he decided New Wave was a more likely opportunity. Given the corporate studio treatment, the models became the ideal crossover band. Street credibility plus big production values. Their breakthrough single for Mushroom Records was I Hear Motion. 
The music from that song came out of not being very good at something. I was trying to work out how to play Stevie Wonder's Superstition, and I couldn't figure it out. And what I ended up playing was I Hear Motion. I wanna see it a lot of the great sounds that were on that, that single and, and that made it quite unique for a, a bit of a, a, an Australian recording at that time was an English producer called Nick Lornay who'd uh, worked with a lot of great people like uh, Public Image and significantly Phil Collins on his, you know, big drum sounds and things. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a, you know, a watershed in, in Australian production. It was when things started getting really excessive, really expensive. Motion was a hit. The strategy seemed to be working. A lot of labels tried to, you know, buy us out or tried to what we call checkbook rock and roll, and there were some great signing wars that we got into and we'd pull out and the band had never happened because a lot of acts when they get into a bidding war think they've made it before they've even made a record. And all they've done is they've made some money and they've got on the racetrack. You haven't even started the car and had the race yet. And that's something that it went from being very hard to get a record deal to getting a lot easier to get a record deal, which was good for Australian artists. But it got to a point where any band that did two good gigs and anyone from Mushroom was seen there, there'd be, you know, five other labels chasing them the next day. I guess I'm lucky. I'm the new wave now got the corporate treatment. Big drums and luscious keyboards were going to sell them around the world. musical entrepreneurs boosted their enthusiasm for new bands with generous lines of cocaine. The uncanny X-Men had a lot of fun flirting with the accessories of corporate excess. You had to pretend you had lots of money, big hair, flashy clothes, um, and play yourself like a millionaire, pretty much. Fuck off! Get the fuck out of here, cunt! Get, get, get. You know, bands like Duran Duran and a lot of those overseas with the big film clips kind of set the pace. And, you know, on ourselves, we used to work very hard at living up to that image. Like, if we had to make an appearance anywhere, well, we'd get a limo. So the kids could say, oh, well, yeah, they're doing well. You'd walk down the street and, ah, oh, yeah, poofed her, you know. And, I don't know why I was a poofter, but uh, I was. Oh, I suppose with the eyeliner and the, and the bangles and the scarves, what am I saying? Just to make you no one called Peter Garrett a poofter. built a career preaching against the evils of this new yuppie world. To prove it wasn't all talk, Peter Garrett became a politician and nearly made it to Parliament. For many, many years we hung off the coattails of England and I believe that now we're hanging off the coattails of one of the superpowers. I don't believe that's a good place for us to be. I think we need to have independent policies which take our own interests as being the first interest. To Midnight Oil and their party faithful, there was one TV show that represented all that was wrong with the rock industry. Once again, the man in the hat was everywhere. Do, do you not have one of these uh, teleprompters? No, not really. You definitely. Countdown became an international known thing, you know? Um, more so in respect to probably the more show in any other part of the world. <laughs> Man 
woke up the Americans that you didn't have to go via England, that this talent was here. And they started looking for it here, you know. It's like, you know, like everyone was sort of, it's almost like sport, you know, like, because the few bands were making yeah. headway overseas and everyone would turn on Countdown to see, you know, how they're going, like, what's yeah. happening. And everyone was proud of, you know, Australian like the music. local bands yeah. that were sort of kicking goals overseas. We're now at the entertainment centre, uh, where in excess have just gone off stage. This place is electric. If you were promoting Oz Rock, you were a patriot. They're very proud of themselves. I know they're going to take off in the States. Talking about the States, let's have a look at the US top five for this week. Yeah. If ever there was an Australian wave, it was now. The band that defined 80s success was in excess. They took the smorgasbord approach and it paid off, especially in the US of A. By that time, we really had sort of developed uh, you know, a, a unique style that, that, as John just said, you know, that sort of fusion of, of sort of funk and rock. Uh, and there was no one doing that, and we hit America, um, and the, uh, you know, the sort of the attitude was like, "What's this?" You know, and yeah. they, yeah. in those days, because we'd, yeah. we'd have some of the you know black urban community coming down, and going, you know, thinking yes. we were a black band Ooh, until they came through. Because we, you know, hey, you won't you listen? <laughs> Get about your troubles in life. You can care all you want. Everybody does, yeah. That's so. And give me a moment, you moves are so wrong. I've got to let you know, I've got to let you know. You wanna my kind. I need you tonight. For a while, Oz Rock was gold. Plane loads of Australian bands took off for fresh fields to seek a share of the foreign swag. Cultural ambassadors, I think, we're spreading um, Australian uh, entertainment to America and playing a big tour of America and Canada. Uh, all expenses paid for by ourselves. Oh, no, no, by the Australian government, actually. Yeah, yeah didn't we get a grant? No, nah, it's OK by me, boys. That Hollywood over there, then. Hey, yeah, you in a sad place, come up to my place and live it up. A hit in, ca in we Canada. Few, we cracked a few things. We cracked a lot. Yeah, <laughs> we cracked a lot of things in America, but not the top forty. Not no. seen. It got, uh, you know, number two in Saskatoon and a few other things like that. I think it was big in Moose Jaw. Now we're sort of we're a Commonwealth band. We have our successes in the Commonwealth countries: yes. Commonwealth, uh, yeah. New Zealand, yeah. Uh, Canada, yeah. 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 the United Kingdom, and Germany, so and Scandinavia, which are also two, yeah. two yeah. Um, huge, huge in Commonwealth. Huge. Number one. The Mentals made a joke of it, but there was serious money to be made from an Australian hit, as they discovered when they toured America with Men at Work. Their single was going up and our album was coming down, so we ended up being the support act for them, and that, you know, that was all breaking right across America at the time. I remember sitting in a restaurant with a band, and. Uh, then when, uh, when Russell, our manager, came in and said to us, oh, he said, we're, we're number one. And um, there was just silence. Radio stations were promising, no Men at Work weekend, you know. We promise we won't play any more Men at Work. That's when you know, you know, you've really hit the big time, you know, saturation play where they really can't take any more of it. And all these people going, wow, you guys, you know, number one. You yeah, be, you whoa, be, let's have a drink. And we're going, yeah, yeah oh, okay. Right. <laughs> it's like, you be excited for us. Yes. Even old Rolling Stones went backstage to pay tribute to the new heroes of the Australian wave. That was so much the fame thing. It was when 
That's what we wanted more than anything was Keith Richards walks yeah. up and says, I really love that, man. Yeah. yeah. Hanging out with you Mick Jagger, that? you know what I mean? Just, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. liked that? It's like, so, you know, yeah. like, being, being, it's like the sort of the rock star word is so weird, but it's, it's actually, the funny thing is, it's what you end up being. Don't ask me what you know is true. Don't have to tell you where I love you. It's all I, I was standing You were there Two worlds collided And they could never tear us apart Excess were filling Wembley Stadium, Australia's punks in exile were facing the more brutal realities of trying to make it in London. Actually, when we arrived in London, it was one of, it, it was a truly depressing thing for us for, for a couple of years, two or three years. By that stage, the London music scene had died and there was nothing going on, or the, or the stuff that was going on was so lame and weak and insipid and echolated that, um, that, that it was hardly there at all. But this conversation's group of my head, Daniel, and Sarah Romeo, and Romeo, and just one group of my head, Daniel, and Sarah Romeo. Australia's punks living on the margin could expect little mercy from Thatcher's Britain, let alone the doll. Technically, it was just one. Uh, mess up after another. As far as getting our records out in time, we'd be uh, doing tours to promote records that never came out, particularly for the first uh, two years. Serious um, sleeping on people's uh, lounges and what have you. Living in exile, boy, what a coup. Look at that passport, still bread and paper. Without privilege. I just don't think um, a lot of a anyone could have really gone on with the kind of conditions that we lived under in the early 80s in London without doing some kind of drug. I think that a kind of anger and a rage developed over in London to just towards our circumstances and towards, uh, towards a feeling that we'd been kind of ripped off. But I do know that some of our most respected singers who used heroin said they couldn't write lyrics without being stoned. Now, I, I, I mean, and I saw that. It was a band that was um, out of control. Um, a band that didn't have any responsibilities to anything. We were kind of cut adrift in London. Um, we didn't have to go home and see our mums the next morning or whatever. We were just sort of pretty much on our own and could do whatever we liked. A life of drugs and drudgery gave songwriters the space to reflect and create. The exiles explored their own country from a distance. The Triffords' wide open road was a subtle search for national identity. The band was just uh, just 
discovering a lineup which I don't think anyone else had used in that way, organ, vibraphone, those sort of things, and to create an atmospheric record because Australian records did not have atmosphere. of authentic experience wasn't what the British wanted from Australian bands. You got fairly used to um, their opinions um, fluctuating and uh, therefore you, you, uh, you accepted graciously the band of the year tag and um, then braced yourself for you know whatever bucket of slime was going to be dropped on you next. What happened to the Triffids happened to many Australian bands who crashed on England's shores. Just the whole attitude that the English had, the record company, you know, was this definite sense that we stunk. You know, we were Australian men. And we probably did, <laughs> you know, but you know, I, had, I, I just remember, I mean, even now it makes my blood boil, you know, just the attitude the English have to Australia, you know, it's just this real intellectual snobbery. Like, and it, what a lot of it's got to do with their own insecurity, the idea that, you know, a colonial society can actually emerge and develop a sense of itself. Exiles that returned, the Australian scene was a parody of itself. Inspired by the approaching bicentenary of white settlement, the video clip makers took to the air. Akubra hats and Ugg boots became rock accessories. National sentiment reached truly epic proportions when Glenn Wheatley brought Johnny Farnham out of retirement. He rechristened him John, then reinvented him as The Voice. Threw everything at that album. I, I, I went out on a limb, um, mortgaging my house and doing all sorts of things to try and find the money to do this album. But thank goodness we did, and we created Australian history. It later went on to become Australia's biggest selling album of all time. Even a few pub rockers got the corporate treatment. Jimmy Barnes was dragged outdoors to beat the drum on behalf of the working class man. It was a huge hit. Cold Chisel, as big as they were, never sold the amount of albums that Jimmy sold on a solo basis. And I think uh, Jimmy had such a wide appeal. And I think one of the things I worked really hard at with him was to really make sure that he, you know, he did more than scream.
Michael Godinski even hired a punk to write songs for the working class man. The Saints' Chris Bailey joined Jimmy at his country retreat. They're very serious songwriters, very serious, really, you know, like ponder the songs and sit there. And I'd be like, yeah, 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 there, give me that fucking thing, there, 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 there. boom, I've got to go and water the horse, you know, and then come back, you know. But I could see them, they were like, fucking, what's this guy on, you know, they couldn't, they wanted me to sit down still and do something. But in the end, that's, you know, that's what they do. <laughs> and, I, and I come in and add, you know, excitement. Your hands are tired. As they dealt with the record industry, many bands of the punk generation had to compromise. The go-between's corporate producers preferred a drum machine to Lindy Morrison. This is what really shits me, is that I've never been given any credit. But, you know, my drumming was so light. It was so, so soft. I mean, it was the style of my drumming in the first four years before the producers ripped my brains and hands apart was to follow the vocal line. That's why you get Cattle and Cain. That's why you you get all those songs that are seven eight. You know, I mean, that's it was a completely different way of playing. And now here's the big one for models. It wasn't the drugs that killed off punk. It was constant touring, bad record deals, mad management, and musical differences. I should be asking this question because all of that success happened after I'd been kicked out of the band. Sure. So what was it like having all this success with number one singles um, and touring well, the world it, and stuff, you know, all that fun stuff? It was sort of bittersweet thing, you know. Was, right, OK. It was bitter because we were suddenly... Without me, you know. We the... were without Andrew and... Extraordinary. We were... When you're in a rock band for seven or eight years, like you become institutionalised. Uh, you, there's no doubt about it because you're being carried from the van to the the um, <laughs> sorry, you don't know what it's pathetic. Why did you oh, kick me out, Sean? Well, it, oh God, can I get a better one than that? We all acted so badly, you know, so atrociously. It was just three years where everybody was so mean. Into a storm, I have to wake up to You know, we sort of thought that, well, with this new management, we've kind of experienced a little bit of, of, um, I guess affluence, even at the expense of aesthetics, and indeed, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and then to break up with someone and be, be living with them and watching them taking other lovers, and uh, continually, <laughs> and uh, and uh, oh, it was just a desperate time. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll try a version of. Uh, the mercy seat. Nick Cave was one of the few who survived the decade. He did by remaining in exile, now in the shadow of the Berlin Wall. We were um, welcomed into an artistic community that, that had something to offer. Um, they were willing to offer us something, which was support and encouragement and things like that, which we felt we'd never really got in London and we'd certainly never got in Australia. Um, and. Um, I don't know, we were going to offer them something, I can't remember what it was, our company. The, the Berlin Tourist Bureau even had a, um, a postcard of Nick Cave's face for Berlin, an ad for Berlin, you know, it said, Nick Cave, Berlin. And there you are, Nick sitting in his room like this. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you know, the, it was even a tourist attraction, I suppose you could call it that. And the mercy seat is awaiting, and I think my head is a burning, in a way I'm yearning to be done with all Nick Cave finally found what he'd been looking for. His journey in exile had provided him with a wealth of material. 
we were still at the stage of um, abusing ourselves a little bit. So, you know, we got a bit blurry over there, but uh, Nick did some great work at that stage of, of his career. For me, it was a really great turning point. I learnt so much there from the Germans and their crazy little studios, because they're, they've got another attitude about it again. It's not like a business. And they'd get fantastic results. Uh, I mean, a little too avant-garde maybe for sort of mainstream work or whatever, but brilliant, innovative things that, uh, that you just couldn't help to be impressed by. In 1987, the world's financial market collapsed, taking the excesses of the music business down with it. As the 80s entrepreneurs were carted off to court, the bands had been coaxed into the corporate corral, started suing each other for the little that they had left. At the front bench of the Supreme Court, there was there was James Freud and uh, and Sean Kelly and my QC or, or my barrister. I'm sorry, the, you know the manager's representation. He had he had Queen's counsel, mm. and I was there sitting at the back of the court, watching my money get spent. At the end of one day, mm. I'd spent five grand. So you know, I thought, geez, if if James and Sean can do that, I can do this. So I rocked up at I fired the barrister that evening and, and turned up at court the following day and uh, Justice Byrne was, uh, was not terribly impressed and uh, so for a week we, uh, <laughs> we put a, each other up in the, in the witness box and cross-examined one another. It was fantastic. Punk had changed everything and nothing. I love it. The 80s goes down as an era when we had our biggest successes. But some of our most exciting and original music was left behind, pissed up against the back wall of the pub. It was a great thing that the Australian music industry did for us in, in that they just ignored us um, and didn't fuck us up. Like the, the ones that they did, did uh, focus their attention on, of course, were, were you know, doomed. Audiences would become more receptive to change in the 90s and music would become more diverse. While Nick Cave was still ignored by mainstream Australia, anger would be the energy for the next generation. His songs would reverberate around the world, but he still comes home to see his mum. I found her on the night of fire and noise Wild bells rang in a wild sky I knew from that moment on that I'd love her till the day that I died And I kissed away a thousand tears My lady of the various sorrows Some begged, some borrowed, some stolen Some kept safe tomorrow On an endless night, silver star spangled The bells from the chapel went jingle, jingle I mean, we had, I had no interest in the mainstream of Australian music. I wouldn't even really know what it was. Um, it was just, it's, it's just as retarded as it is now, probably. You know, we, we hadn't had, um, from early on, a lot of good experiences with, with um, our audiences. Initially, when we used to play, we, when we used to play these sub suburban kind of beer barns and stuff like that in Australia, we, we were just roundly booed off stage or ignored. And the audience that we kind of picked up, the, few, the, the, the small audience that we picked up in Australia were, were um, dedicated in their way, but they weren't very expressive. So we, we were pretty used to playing to kind of dead audiences. Um, and I don't know, I think that we kind of felt somewhere that if, if we behaved in a certain way, they would behave back, and then, that, then some kind of tension would exist between us and the audience. So if you kind of 
hit, kind of club people on the head with a microphone for long enough, they're going to kind of respond. And they did. Um, and this was fine for a while, but, but ultimately, we be, I think we became exhausted by the whole thing, whereas the audience just had this, um, they didn't have to do it every night, something like that, I don't know. But it just became, after a couple of years of it, I, I, you know, I just used to walk on stage and, and loathe and hate them more and more and, and, not, and not feel, instead of feel like a kind of performing ape or something like that. I don't think there are any democracies in, in groups. I don't think it, it's really possible. Um, I, don't, I can't really see how that works. Um, I mean, for me, it, I mean, certainly in terms of ideas, not always in terms of the musicality of things. They were, they were my ideas, and that they were, um, uh, and that in that regard, I was leading the group. Musically, it was, um, it, it's fluctuated and changed very much over the years. Um, I was just. I mean, I've always been in awe of the bad seeds and what they're capable of. And it, and it was always, I was always very happy to give over these ideas to them and allow them to, to pretty much, in terms of the music, do, do with them what they, they wanted. Um, and I, I still feel that way about them. Rock music has the power to make me feel violent. When I go and see it, I, I, I can go away from a rock gig feeling violent. I can't do that from reading a book. Um, and I, d I don't really feel that from looking at a painting. I think that music has um, incredible power. Um, I, think, I, I think especially rock music is, is uh, belittled um, in, from, the art, from the art world, looked at as the, as the very lowest form of um, of art, right at the, bo at the bottom of the ladder, but I, I actually think it's, it's by far the most powerful, by far the most, music in general is, is to me the most mysterious, something that I really don't understand. I write songs for different, certainly for different reasons, um, but they're usually directed at a particular person or a sort of recipient of that song. Um, and they're written for for different reasons, as kind of declarations of the way I feel, or they're, um, they're written to hurt, as acts of vengeance. Um, um, they're written to flatter. Um, but they're definitely mostly written with a particular person in mind. For a long time, sort of wanted to be something else. I wanted to be a writer. When I when I started off, I wanted to be a painter. I thought these were all the kind of uh, where the real kind of creative glory uh, rested. And and more and more, I feel that this is that, that this, this is not true. Um, so I feel I feel very privileged to be a rock musician. I, I was playing acoustic guitar uh, with just acoustics. And I met Ron Stryker, a, a guitarist and men at work, and he was very inspirational. Um, and we worked together for about a year before the Men at Work band formed, and we worked at the Cricketers Arms Hotel <coughs> as a duo. And uh, that, that was great, that was a great time for me. The Cricketers Arms gave us an opportunity to play every week, regardless of whatever else was on offer. It gave us a place to go and to, to bring people to and it was a real personal little gig so people sort of treat it as their own special little secret, you know, and it's like come down to the Cricket's Arms and see this band, so... It's a free gig. Free gig. It was a small venue so even if we only had 50 or 60 people there it was packed. When we put 150 people in there they were hanging from the rafters. I guess the, the other side of the, the Cricketer's Arms was that, that because we were on the ground level and people were literally standing right in front of you, you knew whether what you're doing was working or not. Mm -hmm. You could see whether you'd got their attention or whether they'd just gone off into an alcoholic haze and yeah the end of my saxophone got used as, as an ashtray. I had a, an empty can of beer shoved down the end of it 
Um, I had people talking into the end of the saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who they thought they were talking to. There was really only one label that, that were interested in the end, which was CBS, which, you know, was fortuitous for us because they, they did have, they were a big label and they did get, you know, released in different parts of the world. And, and uh, you know, Peter Carpen signed us and um, everything was quite synchronistic in a sense. There was an American producer in town and in Sydney and... And it was experimental at the same time. It wasn't like they really thought, oh, this band is going to be huge or anything. But I think that there was a, certainly from Peter McKeon's point of view, as an American record producer, he, found, he thought he really had something that he could, that he could mold in a sense because he had, an, he had uh, good songs and he had uh, you know, an interesting voice, uh, my voice, and, and there were his instrumentation also, Greg playing saxophone and flute. There was a lot of elements in the band that he could, that he could work with and indeed did work with and uh, you know it, it proved right it proved it proved that there was a sound that uh, that connected with many different many different people in different parts of the world it didn't really matter whether they spoke english or not indeed in south american countries and um, you know a lot of european countries you know picked up on the band you know long before the americans did the first know. single was actually uh, who can it be now actually got released overseas with no we're almost without our knowledge. In fact, Who Can It Be Now got released in places like France and Israel. Israel was the first country, I think, outside Australia where we had a number one. Yeah, and this was previous to the album. So, and these were not things that, that, that was just like a random thing that the, that the CBS affiliate in that country, somebody heard it and went, oh, this is great, and they put it on. So, and that was a, that was a very sort of uh, positive thing for us because we thought, well, you know, that's, it, it's got its own life here. There is something to this that, that is not just here in Australia or it's not just the record company making it all happen. It, it happened in its... It had a life of its own. So so who can it be now? It had already gone out there and done some stuff before we... Before we did the record. Before the we album. did the album. And uh, and then once the album was ca came out, it really... It was here in Australia that it... And obviously Down Under and so on became very successful. You know, we got a lot of breaks, but at the same time... We had a lot of things to offer, and we had a lot of things, a lot of obstacles that were put in our way that we that we overcame um, all along the way. You know, right from the start, right from the start of, of people, you know, in our hometown going, you know, this this band are not not going to happen. You know, and I mean, I mean, I think one of the reasons why a lot of people did feel that was because that we pretty much ran our own race. You know?